The committee will come to order. I now uh, recognize uh, myself, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. And the hearing is entitled An Examination of the Federal Housing Administration and its Impact on Home Ownership in America. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Uh, okay. There was a time uh, when FHA's policies explicitly denied access to the American dream of home ownership to black families and people of color, making owning a home a privilege afforded primarily to white Americans and contributing to the racial wealth gap as we know it. As of the third quarter of 2019, the white home ownership rate is 73% compared to nearly 48% for Latinos and 43% for black homeowners. Today, FHA plays an important role in our housing finance system that is helping to ensure that access to home ownership is broadly available. In FY 2019 alone, FHA helped over 615,000 borrowers become homeowners for the first time with over 33% of FHA mortgage endorsements serving minority borrowers and over half serving low to moderate income borrowers. FHA also plays a vital role in expanding access to affordable rental housing through its multifamily insurance program. Yet, in the midst of the current affordable housing crisis that burdens so many families with unaffordable rents, Secretary Carson chose to terminate FHA's partnership with the Federal Financing Bank which provided low-cost financing for affordable multifamily housing loans. FHA is designed to play a counter-cyclical role in the housing market, meaning that its market share expands when the private market recedes. This helps provide long-term st stability to the housing market, particularly doing economic downturns. Thankfully, the markets and overall economy have been trending well, due in large part to the focused and driven policies of the Obama administration. Yet, there remain concerns that FHA is failing to take adequate measures to help borrowers avoid foreclosure, including elderly borrowers, with reverse mortgages. In addition, immediately following President Trump's inauguration, HUD suspended a planned quarter point decrease in annual FHA insurance premiums for most FHA insured mortgages. According to research from the National Association of Realtors, roughly 234,000 credit worthy borrowers were priced out of the home buying market in 2014 solely due to FHA's high premiums. Despite the strong financial health of FHA's mutual mortgage insurance fund and calls from advocates and stakeholders to lift the suspension, HUD leadership has maintained this suspension indefinitely. This decision has diminished the home ownership opportunities in St. Louis and across the states, the, the nation, um, locking many hardworking families into rentership and exacerbating the racial wealth gap. With that, I look forward to hearing the testimony of Mr. Montgomery today, and I yield back and recognize 
the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Chairman Clay. I really appreciate you holding uh, this hearing today. Commissioner Montgomery, I appreciate you being here uh, before the subcommittee today. I know you wear multiple hats at HUD, and today we welcome you in your capacity as Commissioner of the Federal Housing Administration, FHA. FHA has a critical mission, helping individuals achieve their dream of home ownership. Achieving that dream has real consequences. Homes act as savings vehicles and are long-term investments that generally appreciate and value. In other words, owning a home and building equity helps families generate wealth. In fact, according to a 2018 study of Duke University, reducing disparities in home ownership by race would narrow the racial, racial wealth gap by 31%. Uh, earlier this year, when some of my colleagues on the other side attacked the idea of gentrification, I urged them to join me in addressing a real solution to um, the, the real problem, and that's the um, disparity in racial home ownership. And I want to re recall on the chairman today to, to work with me on that, those efforts, because I think we both uh, believe in that and want to work on that in the future. And, and Commissioner Montgomery, I would ask you to uh, join us uh, as we try to address that effort, because I think it is a very important effort to help ensure everybody can achieve the American dream, and I, I want to talk more about that. Um, FHA, um, I think, is a very important tool in that, and uh, we should view FHA and private mortgage insurance as important tools for helping people climb the economic ladder, but that ladder needs to be stable. Families can't climb the FHA ladder if the insurance fund, fund has imploded before they get there. Uh, so, uh, you know, Commissioner, you've now served in HUD in three, in different roles in three administrations for President Bush, President Obama, and President Trump. So I know you have real bipartisan credentials of working in three administrations of different political um, uh, folks. Uh, your time spent in public service um, gives you some unique insights into the housing sector and how it's evolved during and after the financial crisis. I wanna hear some of that today. I'm sure your experience has given you an appreciation for FHA's importance as a counter-cyclical buffer, as the chairman talked about, and I think that's really important, um, particularly important during downturns, but also understanding um, of how the razor thin, how razor thin the FHA uh, insurance fund is right now, and although it's a lot better than it was, it's still uh, not where we want it. Uh, that puts taxpayers at risk, and I, I appreciate all the work you've done to rebuild FHA's fund, in fact, uh, to its highest level in 12 years, um, and, and I want to congratulate you for that. I think there's still more to be done, uh, and I'm glad that we're not putting it at risk by artificially cutting rates before the fund is stable. Um, it also begs the larger question of how we can further reform that strengthens housing finance reform by transferring risks from the taxpayers to the private sector, the federal government has a terrible record of pricing risk. And you only need to look as far as the federal flood insurance program to see that. FHA sometimes does that too. But um, by the same token, government can also be less capable of determining which individuals are good risks and therefore should pay less. Uh, so I think there's some reforms we can do on pricing instead of a one-size-fits-all approach that uses the private sector for price discovery, some unique partnerships in the future. And I look forward to talking with the chairman and you about that, because I think some folks deserve to actually uh, do a little better. Um, and uh, with that, I also would ask unanimous consent to insert an opening statement from Ranking Member McHenry, uh, the Ranking Member of the full committee, into the record this without afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen from Ohio, years back, today we welcome the testimony of Commissioner Brian Montgomery of the Federal Housing Administration. The witness is reminded that your test oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. Without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record, and you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Stivers and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to appear before you to discuss the progress and improvements FHA has made recently in the areas within our programs that warrant further attention. FHA has made significant progress in improving the financial performance of its insurance fund, mitigating risk within its programs, reducing regulatory burdens, and modernizing its technology platforms. The successes of these actions were presented to you last month in our 2019 annual report to Congress 
on the state of the mutual mortgage insurance fund. As you know, Congress has a statutory minimum 2% uh, capital ratio for the MMI fund. Uh, the capital ratio is a strong indicator of the fund's financial health and includes our forward and reverse mortgage products. Our annual report showed that the capital ratio increased from 2.76% last year to 4.84% in fiscal year 2019, well above the mandatory 2% minimum. Additionally, the MMI capital, what we used to refer to as economic net worth, was, was $62 billion, more than $27.5 billion from the previous year. While the improved health of the MMI fund is welcome news to us all, the number of households served by FHA is equally good news. In FY19, FHA insured forward mortgages for almost 1 million households, of which 616,000 went to first-time homebuyers. FHA remains an important option for minority communities as well. In fact, last year, minorities represented 36% of all FHA purchase mortgage borrowers, compared to just 20% in conventional lending channels. HUD's housing finance reform plan submitted to the President in September proposes a number of recommendations to further reduce risk to the MMI fund and to protect taxpayers and to ensure FHA maintains its focus on providing mortgage financing for low to moderate income families not served by traditional underwriting. While all the recommendations in HUD's plan are important, several priorities are particularly noteworthy for the purposes of today's hearing. One priority is the need to radically modernize FHA's information technology infrastructure. Our single family business currently runs off 15 different systems, many of them off antiquated mainframes, and some of which are more than 40 years old. In early 2019, HUD formed a highly qualified FHA modernization project team that started by gathering business requirements for every element of the loan life process, from application to origination, servicing, and through claims processing. Working with single family staff at headquarters and in the field, this team has an ultimate objective of fully digitizing the entire loan life cycle. HUD is very grateful that Congress appropriated an additional $20 million specifically to modernize our single-family technology systems earlier this year, and that both the House and Senate appropriations bills for FY20 would provide an additional $20 million. However, we have a way to go and ultimately need 80 to $90 million in total funding to complete these critical and long overdue modernization projects. Beyond our financial health and IT infrastructure, improving FHA's operational ability to serve our customers is also a critical priority, and this is an area where we have made great strides. For example, we have dedicated significant focus to improving single-family default processes. This is making it less burdensome to service FHA loans while ensuring that our loss mitigation options protect taxpayers and promote sustainable home ownership. Additionally, our disaster standalone partial claim implemented last year to assist home homeowners impacted by 2017 disasters will now be a standard mortgage relief option available for all people impacted by major disasters. This allows many homeowners to resume payments without modifying their loan or reamortizing the loan term, avoiding both the foreclosure process and payment increases. It also streamlines income documentation and other requirements to expedite relief. Looking forward, we must focus on seeking the right balance between facilitating access to mortgage credit and better managing our risk. Our mission is to make certain FHA remains a stable and reliable resource to provide housing finance support for first-time home buyers and other underserved borrowers. I believe that is a mission that we all share. Again, I want to thank the subcommittee for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I want to thank the commissioner for uh, your testimony today. Also. Uh, we are in the middle of a vote series on the House floor, so at this time we're going to recess uh, and we'll uh, immediately reconvene after the last vote and we get back over here. Thank you for your patience with us. We stand the chair as four votes. We stand in recess, I'm sorry.
The committee will come to order, and let me thank uh, our witness for your patience. Uh, we are now ready to proceed under the five-minute rule, and I will uh, yield myself five minutes uh, to begin the question phase of the hearing. Over the last year, HUD has taken a number of actions to reduce the ability of FHA borrowers to utilize down payment assistance programs from governmental entities to purchase a home and has indicated that it again intends to issue a proposed rule affecting government down payment assistance in January. Secretary Carson testified before this committee in June that he was not familiar with the HUD data that identifies which government entity is providing down payment assistance. It appears that HUD cannot determine which government programs are providing down payment assistance on any FHA loan, which is critical before attempting to issue new regulations of government down payment assistance program. Will you commit to not moving forward on any rule making or other administrative changes related to down payment assistance provided by governmental entities until HUD is able to collect data on individual governmental entities and has analyzed a statistically significant amount of data on the performance and pricing of FHA loans with down payment assistance from each specific governmental entity. Can you expound on that, Mr. Administrator? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, down payment assistance has a long history at, uh, at FHA. When I was commissioner last time, uh, a certain type of down payment assistance ultimately uh, cost FHA more than $16.5 billion in losses. Uh, according to our independent actuary, Did you say we'll 16 or 60? 16 and a half billion dollars in losses, and on um, down payment assistance. Tell well, me how how that works. Sure. Well, this 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 type of down payment assistance, which is no longer permitted, actually put the down payment on the mortgage. So while it was technically called a gift, it was a gift you ended up paying for. As you can imagine, the default rate on those loans was almost uh, uh, wait, 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 five wait, times wait. as much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Administrator, down payment assistance is normally used to help first-time home buyers or those who qualify in that manner uh, to help them get into a home. Uh, it's not a significant amount, but it, it, it closes the gap to get cheaper loans. So tell me what the problem is. Well, I just want to make sure that any down payment assistance provider is doing so within what our rules permit, whether it's a jurisdictional, whether it's whether or not they financial benefit off the transaction, which HERA doesn't permit. So I will commit that any effort to undertake rulemaking will be deliberate, it'll be based on research and, and facts as we know it. Again, we just want to make sure that any DPA is done in the best interest of the borrower and not there to enrich people that are providing it. No, and I agree totally with that perspective, that the DPA should be done in the interest of the borrower. And you and I know it goes to close the home ownership gap and there are other benefits uh, to the DPA. And so I, I would just hope we could um, reach some kind of uh, accommodation that the data would back up any decision made by the department. Let me, let me ask you, uh, one of the first actions that the Trump administration took upon being sworn into office was to suspend a planned reduction in FHA's annual premiums by 25 basis points, which would have saved the average borrower $500 in the first year alone. In response to calls from advocates to allow the premium reduction to be implemented in light of the FHA's improved financial health, Secretary Carson stated that he would keep the rate as low as we can, con consistent with the law. But since then, Secretary not only maintained the suspension on premium reduction, 
He has proposed to arbitrarily increase the capital ratio far above what is statutorily required. Does Secretary Carson still stand by his original statement that he will keep premiums as low as possible, consistent with the law? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in many ways, I, I run a $1.4 trillion corporation, so I have to carefully monitor our cash inflows and our obviously our cash outlays. Mm -hmm. We consistently look at premium structure, whether, you know, it's hard to say this one is too much or too little. Mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at, do we have the right structure in terms of what, how much is on the upfront or how much is on the annual? So it's something we consistently look at and will continue to do so through this first term. Okay. All right, and I, I thank you for your responses. I now yield five minutes to my colleague from Ohio, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. It's very important, and um, I think there's a number of issues that uh, I want to try to illuminate and, and work on. Commissioner, thank you for being here. I appreciate your service in three administrations, uh, two Republicans, one Democrat, and uh, the fact that you've worked to shore up the FHA insurance fund to meet the 2% statutory uh, capital requirement. Uh, that's a very important, uh, it's already, that's already not a lot of money, but that is the minimum required and I appreciate it, you getting it there and keeping it there. Uh, that's a great accomplishment. It's something I've been concerned about a long time. Um, I had mentioned a couple things in my opening statement. I'd like to follow up on them if that's all right with you. The first I talked about was um, whether you might be willing to work with uh, the chairman and I and stakeholders to address the disparity in home ownership by race. Is that something that you might be willing to work with us on? A absolutely, sir. In fact, we've convened an internal working group on this uh, several months ago to look at minority home ownership because as you articulated in your statement, it is down. And I think the, the, the chairman uh, mentioned the statistics in his opening statement. Obviously, that disparity is too great, great and it uh, it leads to a disparity in wealth as well because it's the biggest saving vehicle most people have. So I wanna again, thank you for your willingness to work with us. We very much look forward to working on that topic. It's a very important topic because the American dream needs to be accessible by every American. It's something all of us believe. It's something that you believe. We wanna work together to find a way to figure out what's driving the disparity and figure out how to address that disparity. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, common sense approach. We look forward to working with you on that. The second thing I mentioned was the fact that uh, the one-size-fits-all FHA premiums don't give a potential risk-based discount for people that are of lower risk. Would you be willing to work with us and potentially, um, you know, stakeholders and even folks in the private sector? Because given the government's history of mispricing risk, uh, I think there's a lot of private sector, um, you know, um, uh, mortgage insurance companies and others that could help um, in a partnership with you as we try to figure this out. Is that something that you'd be willing to work with us and maybe some outside um, private entities to figure out if we can find a way to do something like that to make sure that people that deserve a little bit of a break get a little bit of a break, even if we limit that break? Ab absolutely, sir. Thanks for your question. As I mentioned, we, want, we just want to make sure we're not intruding on private capital. As you know, there are private mortgage insurers out there that work with the GSEs. Well, and I think they can be part of this solution. They have very elaborate uh, systems and data. And one of the other things that I didn't mention to you, but we've talked about privately, is I am so happy that Congress gave you $20 million, a down payment, to update your IT infrastructure. Uh, I understand you're now using Abacus 2.0, so that's a, that's a start. But I'd Seems really like, like to something. make you a little more modern than that. <laughs> so I know we need to work to make sure we continue to give you the resources you need to upgrade that. and the, Chairman and I had a, a little aside where we both acknowledged that uh, we need to inv help you invest in your technology, but I think I want to again acknowledge you can partner with some outside industry that have the data and the computing systems to help you as you do this, including our private mortgage insurers. There's no reason you need to compete against them when you could actually work with private industry and make it a win-win for everybody. Is that something you'd be open to? A absolutely. I mean, there are certain things we're prohibited from doing by statute, but... Uh Great thing about statutes is we can change them, Mr. Commissioner. So. Yeah, no, absolutely, we're, we're certainly open to that. And, <laughs> and we're very thankful for the, for the down payment on our technology upgrades. This is something I tried to get through when I was commissioner last time. I know the previous administration tried as well, so we were very happy that Congress got us on the, the good trajectory to get us to a better place in our technology. Thank you, and I, you know, I just want to mention one other program that sometimes get much aligned, maligned and let you uh, talk about it a minute because 
uh, what you guys have done to make the reverse mortgage program work. And, and reverse mortgages are not for everybody. But just because they're not for everybody doesn't mean they're not for anybody. Um, and I want to give you a second to talk about what you've done to help make sure that those programs have the right guardrails around them to protect senior citizens, but also um, are there for people that might need cash flow and have that biggest saving vehicle I talked about, their home. Well, the reverse mortgage program provides a great social mission, helps seniors age in place. You're right, it's not for every particular uh, senior. It depends on their situation. But it is obviously, like a lot of things, was impacted by the housing collapse. It seemed to be the, the very top of the apogee in terms of volume was at the time when house prices came down. Obviously, the HECM program was impacted by that. Uh, the previous administration made some headway in dealing with this, working with Congress through the Reverse Mortgage Stabilization Act. And we thankfully, because of good house price appreciation and some other changes that we made, seem to be heading in a much better place than we were last year, and thus being able to help senior, seniors age in place. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witness for appearing. How are you, sir? It's good to see you again. Um, I am concerned about the role of expanding access to home ownership as well, and it's uh, good to hear that the chairman and the ranking member are working in this area. Um, one of the things that uh, we have been looking at is additional credit scoring. Some call it alternative credit scoring. Have you any intelligence on this, any research that's been done, anything that you're doing in-house that might be a benefit? Well, Congressman, when I was, thank you for that, when I was commissioner last time, uh, you may recall that we worked together with, with your office and yes. uh, some of the affinity groups in the real estate saying, well, we're not quite sure which way to go with, with alternative trade lines, alternative credit score models. And it struck me at the time, and still today, that if we were to do a pilot program looking at that, it, it would, that FHA, I think, would be the appropriate place to conduct that, that pilot. Technology has moved substantially uh, since 06, 07. Uh, there's, there's more players in that industry. And uh, if you look at the statistics, 25 to 35 million Americans either have no credit score or they have thin file credit. And I just think, I believe my heart of hearts, I want the data to back it up. I think there's a way to look responsibly and in the best interest of bars to look at non-traditional credit in ways that might, it might open the aperture somewhat. For those who may not understand the term non-traditional credit, would you kindly give some explanation, please? Well, there's several different models out there. There's some that look at so-called traditional credit, credit cards, auto loans, things of that nature, and maybe score them a little differently than others. There's others that look at you know, cell phone bills, utility payments, rent payments, things of that nature, and, and factor the, your payment history in, into that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some that do a little of both. So again, I, I don't have all the answers to it today. I just think a prudent approach would be to conduct a, a pilot and to see where that, where that would take us. Which, as you know, sir, was, was put into HERA in 2008. Um, yes. and, but but the, for whatever reasons, the, the pilot was never, uh, never implemented. Yes, I and do. And the authorization ran out. I do recall that it was legislation that I had the good fortune to sponsor. Um, and you did work with me. Uh, as you know, we have tried to maintain the traditional model and only add additional information, additional information about the lights, gas, water, phone, cable. Um, not, and I have to continually emphasize, we don't decide that we're going to eliminate the traditional model. All of that stays there, but there are some people who benefit from having a rich payment history in these other areas, and that helps them. I find it interesting to note that um, at yesterday's hearing, we uh, had uh, representatives from five agencies here, including um, the Fed, FDIC, um, actually it was three, OCC wasn't present, but, um, and they have a joint communique where they have indicated that this is something worthy of consideration. So it looks like we're moving in that direction. It's just a question of how long will it take us to have that pilot program that you're talking about. And I'm working with my friends on the other side 
to see if we can collaborate and come to some reasonable, um, reasonable conclusion as to how to move forward with this. Uh, would you just respond to the notion of maintaining the tr traditional model and simply adding additional credit? This is why I say additional as opposed to alternative, because it causes some people to believe that we're going to forego the additional model traditional model, and I, that is not at all what we're talking about. Are your comments, please? Sure. I, I, again, sir, I think there's <clears throat> a way to do it. I think we would both agree it should be done res responsibly uh, and in the borrower's best interest. But you know, remember, that'll be a two-way street. Uh, so whereas you may have good payment history in some of those non-traditional trade lines, if you also begin to pay late, you're going to feel that as well. The, the, no different than if you pay your your credit card bill later, make your automobile payment late as well. So again, I, I just want to make sure that, sir, that you know, the committee understands that if we're to do it, we think we should look at it in ways that are in the best interest of the consumer and done responsibly, and it strikes me that FHA would be the appropriate vehicle to use to do that. Well, thank you. And uh, HUD in general. And you and I have talked before. Why don't we uh, have an additional conversation on this? Uh, my time is up now, but let's, let's have my staff get with you so that we can make an appointment and flesh this out. Yes, sir. I'll okay. be happy to. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I yield back. Thank you for your time. The time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luca Myers, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Montgomery. I uh, want to start off with a question with regards to the False Claims Act. Uh, memorandum of understanding the MOU was recently announced between the Department of Justice uh, on the use of the Cla False Claims Act. And I'm just curious, could you give me some details on this, what you hope it will accomplish, and I guess from the standpoint of how big a barrier has the False Claims Act been, and uh, what do you hope the MOU uh, would, um, how will it affect the, the mortgages and make it more accessible or whatever? So can you help us out? Sure. Thank you, sir. Well, when I was commissioner last time, we, we had a pretty good balance between the percentage of lenders who were depositories and non-depositories. Uh, we're kind of out of balance now, about 13%. Of our originations now come from uh, from depositories. As recently as 2010, it was about half, and most of them will tell you they point to the the False Claim Act uh, as the reason they got out of the FHA program. Some of them got out of the VA program. It's, it's not my intent to take sides in that argument between independent lenders and depositories. Uh, I just think for a lot of reasons we need to find equilibrium there. I also think, uh, and a lot of the consumer advocate groups agree with me on this point, they see it as an access to credit issue because a lot of families who have banking relationships at a large depository who are first time home buyers are finding that their depository doesn't offer the FHA program, which is the nation's flagship home buying program since 1935. To me, that just seems a, a, a little odd. That's not to say that we look the other way with fraud or, or people that don't follow by rules, quite the contrary. We just think somewhere between um, an indemnification and the equivalent of a drone strike on a lender, uh, that in this case they just got out of the program, there needs to be something in between. And the Justice Department, working with our, our general counsel, our staff, we, we found a good place that I think brings a little a little more focus to the program gives FHA and HUD a bigger voice in saying, okay, this rises to the level of False Claim Act, and therefore we would recommend or concur with justice going forward. So you mean a statement ago that 13 percent are from depository institutions and the other 87 will be from independent? Yes, sir. Credit um, unions. Financial, you know. Oh, credit unions would fall, they're depository institutions. No, they would fall under the depositories, but Okay, yeah. so independent would be, what, the Quicken Loans of the world, is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir. Lenders like Quicken, some are privately held, some are publicly traded. Offline, uh, online lenders and offshore and all that kind of stuff. Well, you have to be approved, obviously, and okay. we, we have criteria right. for that. That's but. an amazing statistic. I, 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 it kind of took me by surprise here. I, was not prepared for that. So, wow, that's well. Well, we were just happy that a lot of the consumer groups, Center for Responsible Lending, yeah. NCRC, and others okay. were, were on our side on this topic. And that, okay, great. That well, helped. Thank you. Appreciate your um, explaining that. Um, also, with regards to uh, the risk in your portfolio, uh, you know, obviously things are going well. Uh, we're increasing the um, uh, capital account. 
But uh, we've noticed that the credit scores seem to be going backwards. There's some earlier defaults and some debt to income ratios are rising. Should we as Congress be concerned about that? Uh, or what are you doing to address that? Is that just uh, the nature of the economy? Uh, what, what, what's going on there? Because uh, I'll, I'll try to boil down an hour long response, <laughs> sir. But we, 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 we conduct daily you know, stress tests on our portfolio. And uh, we've been concerned about the number of loans that come in with, with risk layering, which is a combination of high debt to income ratio, uh, you know, low credit scores, and uh, loans that came in from about August of 2016 up until we made a change of the total scorecard um, were, were modeled at about a 1.4 capital ratio, the last loan end. That's not where we want to be. Congress requires us to have a minimum 2%. So we made some changes to the total scorecard uh, that went into effect in March of this year. They had seemed to be having their intended effect. It seems like we've stopped the three-year slide in credit scores. They've actually leveled off and improved one point. Yeah, well, I want to make one quick question before my time goes away. So it, the concern is that even though you've got a, a, you're, you're very well capitalized right now, you apparently have more risk in your portfolio than you would normally like to have. So in order to have, be able to accommodate more risk, you're going to have to have more capital in order to be able to continue to be a solvent and, uh, entity and have enough reserves there to ride this out until you get this portfolio back in, in shape, I would assume. How long do you think it's going to take to do that? Well, certainly the house price appreciation has helped in a strong economy. Again, we just want to make sure we call it, you know, turning the dial. We want to make sure we have access to credit. We want to make sure that, you know, should there be a downturn, that we have ample amount of reserves to weather that. So okay. thank you very sort much. of a tricky dance, but we, we, we think we're managing it well. Yeah. Well, we'll be watching. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Montgomery, for being here. Very much appreciate it. Uh, we've been talking a lot today, of course, about uh, increasing home ownership and addressing the shortage of affordable housing across this country. So one of the issues I want to take a look at is manufactured housing, because in many cases it can cost up to 30 percent less and in some cases more uh, for folks to be able to afford that. Uh, so if we're going to talk about it, though, we have to make sure it's a way to provide affordable housing and, and truly make sure that it is. I don't know if you're aware of what's occurred in Iowa over you know, the last year or so, but I'd love to give you a brief background. Unfortunately, a company named Haven Park Capital, which is a fund from Utah, has bought now seven manufactured housing communities in Iowa, and then they proceeded to raise the lot rents for the residents there between 20 and 70%. So they came in and just raised the rate 20 to 70 percent for these families, many of whom are on fixed incomes. Um, I visited one of those communities, uh, Midwest Country Estates in Waukee, and saw firsthand the terrible position that these folks are really being put in. And just yesterday, I spoke to one of those residents, Matt Chapman, um, who's about to be paying 70 percent of his income for housing. Uh, we know the standard definition of severely cost burdened is paying 50 percent of your income on rent. And here's a constituent who owns his home outright, has no mortgage, and has to pay 20% more than the 50% that we think is severely cost burdened. So he doesn't know what he's going to do, and many of his neighbors just don't know how they're going to make this happen. Uh, it's just simply unaffordable for so many residents like him and others across the country. Uh, many of these properties were purchased with federally supported loans. So we need to make sure that our constituents aren't being taken advantage of because they can't relocate. Um, and these are the kind of predatory practices that unfortunately are being allowed to continue. So I'd love to ask you, Commissioner, um, you know, I've been working on trying to find solutions to prevent this from happening again. And given your experience in housing, I just wanted to ask you, what, what recommendations do you have that we should be putting in place? Well, and I'd be happy, by the way, to follow up, but we have more, more time to discuss it. But manufactured housing is, you know, 22 million Americans live in manufactured housing. We regulate the construction of manufactured housing um, and uh, throughout the country. Between my time as commissioner last time and, and, and this time, the technology, the construction standards and all that have made leaps and bounds so much we're almost having a hard time keeping up with it. We've also been looking at the financing of aspect relative to FHA, you know, there's Title I and Title II, not getting too in the weeds here. Uh, the Title I doesn't have a lot of volume in it. 
tends to be more sort of what they call chattel loans versus the traditional FHA Title II. Uh, we think there's a way to, to make it more affordable because uh, you've you heard me reference earlier in my opening statement, the average income of a manufacturer of the home owner is between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a year. So and again, it's part of the things we're looking at in, in sort of a pro-consumer aspect, ways that we can perhaps get some of that cost of financing down. We have less purview, being honest with you, on sort of the structure of communities. Again, more so the regulation of the of the actual manufacturing of it, of the uh, of the structure. Okay, well, I appreciate that, and I would love to see what information you have. At least three of these seven properties were bought with Fannie Mae loans, and you know, it's so it's not as if federal government's not involved in it. I, I hate to see that. I, we believe that they actually overpaid as well for the the community that I was just talking with you sure. about. Um, I'm sure they they did. Um, and I think that we could have, if we had pieces in place, those owners could have pooled together and possibly purchased it for themselves um, and been able you know, to stay in their homes and not just to afford it, but when we see these kinds of predatory actions, they're asking children to literally give up their dogs because they're too big for the, the homes, uh, according to their new rules. They're uh, forcing families to tear down swing sets um, that they don't think are, um, I guess, good looking enough. Um, but these aren't people who can afford those $2,000, $3,000 rainbow uh, sets uh, that some other people can. So any help that you can give us, these people truly have been put in a position where they don't know what their answer will be. Many of them will not be able to afford this and will be forced out of their homes, including taking their children with them and not being able to find an affordable option. So I'd appreciate your follow-up on some of those things we just talked about and any other things that you might think we could put in place. Absolutely. I will look forward to following up with you or your staff on it. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back, and the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, welcome. Uh, the FHA's recent report to Congress showed that uh, the FHA's financial health is in just about the best shape it's been since the financial crisis, and appreciate your stewardship on that. But did want to follow up on maybe some potential areas that uh, could impact that. And I'd like to be able to talk about the property assessed clean energy loans. Uh, these loans have been used in some cases to be able to trick some seniors and other vulnerable citizens into taking out high interest energy loans for green energy appliances in their homes as collateral. And uh, in some of these cases, it's actually squeezed these Americans to the point of foreclosure. Um, do you believe that the use of these pace encumbrances on FHA-insured loans pose a risk uh, to the health of the MM MMIF and uh, that the FHA's current policy on pace encumbered loans? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, what, what's, what makes it, us overly concerned about that is we don't know how many. As you know, we don't allow it on new FHA loans and haven't for several years, but it's unknown if you're an existing FHA borrower how many try to take out PACE loans. We're, we're not, um, we, we, look, we think solar power and all that is fine. Yep. Our concern is that those, those loans prime ours. They step in front of the National Housing Act, which I think we would all agree is it's probably not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, again, working with FHFA as well, because uh, you know, they're equally concerned about how can we work together to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, there's a across the board an agreement, as, as you know, to, uh, to be able to have a good, sensible energy use uh, to be able to benefit our people. But would there be some benefit in being able to have some national clarity uh, on PACE loans? Uh, because we do have some states where they have authorized programs that have been enacted on ability to repay uh, laws and licensing requirements for the PACE lenders, and other states have not. So would that national clarity be of some use? Well, again, we, we're intimately concerned because of it priming our loan, which that's, you know, sacred in our world that we have to be in a first loss position. So we're, we're, we're concerned about it, but something, again, we continue to work with FHA and would certainly welcome the opportunity to work with you as well, sir. Well, we appreciate that. I think, uh, again, we, we all support the uh, all of the above energy po policy, but we don't want it putting people into a position where they actually do lose their homes. Uh, another topic here, due to the uh, lower FHA premiums uh, plus more expansive qualified mortgage definition, where currently approximately 55% of the FHA, FHA purchase loans exceed 43% debt-to-income ratio, and artificially high fees such as LLPAs, 
uh, charged by the GSEs and many other borrowers or drive the FHA to secure mortgage financing for no other reason than the FHA loan is cheaper, at least initially. Uh, the combination of these policies does create an unlevel playing field and advantages the 100% backed FHA program and gives the consumers ultimately fewer choices. Uh, would you agree that these inconsistent and sometimes arbitrary differences are driving borrowers into the markets? Well, we certainly look at risk uh, characteristics, including the use of risk layering. Uh, DTI by itself, just like credit scores by itself, is not necessarily the prime um, decisioning tool, if you will. We look at them in the aggregate. Uh, as you know, touching this issue is the, the QM patch, uh, which is slated to go away in January of 2021. Mm -hmm which would essentially push a lot more of those higher DTI loans toward us. So without going down that path on the limited time, I just say DTI is something we look very carefully at, knowing by itself it's not the end-all be-all in terms of credit risk, but it certainly accounts for something. Whether or not we would need to put some sort of residual income test in, like the Veterans Administration does, again, are all things we're looking at in a total access to credit review of the portfolio. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, I guess, finally, what I'd like to be able to know is, I come from a rural part of America. A lot of our focus in these committee hearings is on urban America and on housing issues that are there. Uh, what actions is FHA taking to be able to help rural communities across the country? Well, well, certainly in terms of loan limits, looking carefully at what the loan limits are in those communities. And we mentioned manufactured housing as a viable opportunity. In multifamily, um, the GNCs tend to concentrate in urban areas. Us and USDA tend to focus, focus more in rural communities in terms of developing multifamily properties. Thank you. Now, yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, so, so I can get a, a clear understanding is uh, uh, what is the average uh, homeowner's uh, loan that FHA insures uh, uh, for a family um, of two that are applying for a loan? Well, looking at the data from, from FY19, our average borrower made about $62,000 a year, um, bought a $183,000 home, and more than likely used about $8,000, or about half of them use down payment assistance, and that average was about $8,000. Okay, and does that require that the, I think the down payment used to be, what, 10% or less? It, it, for us, sir, it's 3.5%. We, we call it the minimum cash investment, but it's 3.5%. Okay. Uh, are those fixed loans? Um, we do have an ARM product. Most people do a fixed product. Okay. Now, uh, since, uh, like in areas that I'm from where there's been a lot of disaster uh, uh, from hurricanes and uh, people inability uh, to recover right away. Uh, what programs have you implemented uh, in order to try to help those homeowners so they will be able to maintain their property until they can get back into uh, uh, on their feet? Well, the primary thing that we, we, we want to do is, you know, FHA assistance typically comes in later after FEMA, after SBA, after, you know, whatever insurance they have on the home. And we have any number of products, as I mentioned in my opening statement, a uh, product that we originally used in Hurricane Katrina, uh, we used for the, uh, in, in Puerto Rico, the, the standalone partial claim, um, which allows us to, to immediately go in and assess a home buyer situation and take any arrearages they have and put them as a soft second lien on that mortgage and not change the amortization, not change the term of the mortgage or anything. Um, and we had some pretty good success using that in New Orleans and also in, uh, in uh, Puerto Rico. We've now made that standard as of a couple months ago going forward to use in other disasters. We also have a product that if your home is, uh, is completely destroyed, uh, that you can, there is a, an a, a FHA product, the 203H, I believe, that allows you to get 100% financing if your apartment or whatever has been destroyed as a result of a hurricane. Uh, my next question is centered around uh, with two individuals. Uh, uh, can two individuals who are not married 
uh, apply for FHA loan, uh, and how would you handle it if they do? Well, they, they have to either be married, either common law married. Um, you, you couldn't, as just roommates, your best friend or whatever, apply together. Okay. And I think that's, that's more of a, of a bank requirement than, than ours. Okay. Now, uh, would FHA Housing Financial Administration Risk Sharing Program expand uh, Jenny May's authority and involvement in affordable housing I increase risk to the federal government? Well, the, the, the multifamily risk share program, I think, is a perfect model of the federal government working together with developers and state HFAs. And uh, the, the part, that program still exists. There was another part of it, uh, the, the federal financing bank, if, if that's where you were headed, uh, that that's no longer permitted. Uh, but the ideal solution would be for Jenny May to, to Virginia May sort of securitize those loans that are done using the FHA risk share program, okay, which, which has an extremely low default rate. Okay. How do you go about calculating uh, the debt to saving ratio for those who apply? Well, we have what are called front end ratios and back end ratios, you know, looking at your, your bills uh, with and without your mortgage payment. Front end's 31, back end's 43. Uh, with compensating factors, you can go as high as 57, 58 percent. Okay. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner uh, Montgomery, thank you for being here uh, with us today. First, I would like to uh, commend you and Secretary Carson you. for your work uh, to restore the financial health of the FHA. Um, I believe we should all be pleased that the mutual mortgage insurance fund's capital ratio increased to 4.84 percent last year, which is, of course, well above the statutorily required 2 percent minimum and the highest it has been since fiscal year 2007. Just yesterday, I met with the Tennessee Housing uh, Development Agency, the THDA, to discuss a number of housing issues facing Tennessee. THDA helps ensure housing is available and affordable to people in every county, including many of the rural and often underserved counties in Tennessee's 6th District. Providing down payment assistance is an important aspect of what state housing finance agencies do. HUD has legitimately raised concerns about the performance of FHA mortgages with down payment assistance. But I believe that down payment programs managed through state HFAs do considerably better than in those managed by some others. Uh, I know in Tennessee, THDA has been providing down payment assistance responsibly for over four decades. Commissioner, as, as HUD contemplates new rules around down payment assistance programs, do you plan to take into consideration these kinds of distinctions rather than trying to implement a more sweeping approach? Well, thank you. Uh, Congressman, for, for that question. I, I worked, uh, when George W. Bush was governor, I worked at the state of Texas Housing Finance Agency, and we were probably the, the largest at the time. And I've, I've met with NCSHA, I've made, met with state HFA. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting with NCSHA on Monday uh, while they're in town. And as I have told them, as we look at DPA writ large, the, the type of DPA provided by state and local HFAs is not my worry, not my concern. As I referenced earlier when I had a similar question, I just want to make sure any DPA that's provided by other entities works within our program guidelines from a financial benefit perspective, which isn't allowed, and from a jurisdictional requirement. And that's, you know, what we're carefully looking at. We all do this just to help ensure that it's done with the best interest of the borrower, not, you know, enriching someone providing down payment assistance. Thank you. As I've said before in previous committee proceedings, manufactured housing is incredibly important to my district. HUD's, uh, or manufactured homes account for 13.1 percent of occupied housing units in my district, compared to 7.1 percent in the greater uh, United States. HUD's housing reform plan recognizes that there is a need to update FHA's guidelines for its manufactured housing programs, but such changes have also been pending for a number of years. I want to echo Ms. Axney's concerns about the changes. 
And for you, what will you do to implement the necessary changes as soon as possible? Well, one thing I think is long overdue, we need to elevate the status of that office. Um, and we'd like to work with you on that to make it run by a deputy assistant secretary, which it's not. We want to separate it out. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, when I toured a plant when I was commissioner last time, and I toured one earlier this year, the, the technology upgrades have been tremendous in that, in that industry. Uh, my affection for that industry was born, again, back to my state of Texas HFA days, where at some point there were more new manufactured homes sold in Texas than there were stick and bricks homes, which is kind of hard to believe, but there was a point in time where that happened. I firmly believe it's a viable option and a darn good one to help families, mostly in rural communities. One thing that continues to concern me is that the volume of manufactured home loans being supported by FHA continues to decline. As you mentioned, Title I program loans are almost non-existent. Uh, although the vast majority of manufactured homes are financed as chattel, FHA financed only 526 chattel home loans uh, homes last year. Without access to FHA financing, many families are unable to attain the dream of home ownership through manufactured housing. Commissioner, where are updates to the FHA's financing programs for manufactured housing on HUD's overall priority list? Well, part of our look at the FHA program entirety is, the spending, is, is included in spending more time on Title I and in Title II as it relates to manufactured housing, which, you know, was to be on a foundation. So it's too early to, to give you any sort of direction which way we're going. We know the numbers are low, but again, we just want to make sure any changes we made are done with the consumer's best interest and heart. By the way, to get back to your, your, your previous question, uh, we have picked up the pace in looking at these, these uh, new sets of standards that have come out of the Manufactured Housing Consensus Committee regarding, you know, stairs, uh, garages, carports, even second floors, and I think, I think we're getting caught up. But the committee's moving quickly. We're just trying to catch up with them. Thank you, and I yield back. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleveland, is, who is also the chair uh, for the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Um, uh, on Tuesday evening, uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty from this committee and Congressman uh, Lacey Clay from Missouri, who chairs this committee, and I had a Midwest summit, and we brought people in, uh, in here uh, for a dinner summit meeting from uh, all over the Midwest, um, the upper Midwest, the lower Midwest. Uh, and we, we, uh, we, talked with, we, we talked with them about a, a number of issues, and they, uh, then we listened to what they thought, and, and they did not surprise us in the fact that they believe that, um, that affordable housing, uh, or the lack thereof, uh, is, um, is, is in a crisis. And uh, I don't think that there is a need for much imagination to see that that is, in fact, uh, the, the truth. And, and so, um, uh, in terms of all, all of the things that, that uh, we need to be doing uh, to um, uh, correct that problem, uh, I, I am a, a little concerned about um, HUD's uh, reform program, uh, finance reform program, um, you know, even if you work with the GSEs, I'm concerned that, that if you're trying to reduce the HUD uh, footprint, that the crisis will become uh, even more uh, critical. Uh, I mean, this, I would, my, my uh, belief is that this is a time for us to be more creative. It doesn't mean be, we need to become more of a thrift, uh, 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 an agency that is only concerned about um, you know, giving everybody money and, and buy, for them to buy homes, that's, that's not what I'm saying. We don't want you to be a spendthrift agency. <clears throat> but, you know, it would, I, would, I would feel comfortable, and I think I, I'm, what I'm saying millions of other people would as well, if we had programs, as you're looking at reform, uh, that are, 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 are trimmed, but also uh, sufficient enough to make a, a, a difference. And um, 
right now we're going in the opposite direction. Uh, and, and there's a, I mean, it's difficult to get developers to do something unless they, if you're gonna do, do affordable housing in the, in the urban core, you're gonna have to have some kind of subsidy. Uh, municipal subsidy, tax, low, t low income tax credits, you have to have something, it just won't work. The numbers don't work. So can you uh, assure me that, that's, that, that we're not gonna start eliminating 202 programs, uh, we're not gonna start, well you don't have any control of, of CDBG, but many of the communities need CDBG in order to, get, to help developers get started, if, if only with, with in infrastructure. So uh, can you fill me in on, on the reform program and what you think ultimately will happen? Certainly, thank you, uh, Congressman. In terms of multifamily housing, obviously 202 and 811, the, the RAD program, which you know is uh, uh, helping renovate you know, hundreds of thousands of, of units around the country. Uh, we've now launched a, a, a program to use uh, for new construction for FHA uh, with tax credits. We also are now permitting the RAD program to be used with, with the 202 program. These have all happened in the last year. On the single family side, it's, it's, there's not a lot we can do to, to help build supply. Although through this affordability council that was stood up a few months ago, we wanna help kind of pull back the curtain on a lot of the local decision making, whether it's zoning or set asides, is driving up the cost of housing in many communities to where they're very, building very little entry level housing. And the cost to manufacture a mortgage, for example, has gone up almost twice from what it was 10 years ago. So there's a lot of factors present out there uh, that, that do give us concern, but many of them are born of decisions made at a state or local level that we have less control over. Well, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> but I have, I have towns in my district like Higginsville, like Marshall, like Sweet Springs, like Oric, like Mayview, where they haven't had a new house built in decades, or, or certainly over a decade, and, and, they, and they need help. Uh, you know, that, there used to be a program called UDAG uh, uh, that didn't come out of your prop, out of your shop, but but out of HUD, Urban Development Action Grants, and those 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 programs allowed for municipalities uh, to help a developer get started in in, in programs. So I, I think the 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 HUD side is going to have to become more active, and I and and maybe your request for them to become more active would would result in in uh, more affordable housing. I appreciate the time. I wish we had more. Well, I would just add the opportunity zones. We, we are now seen as an excellent way to help expand housing and have made some adjustments as I articulated in my opening statement that I think will help uh, create more supply and more investment in those opportunity zones. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldine, is recognized now for five minutes. Thank you to Commissioner Montgomery for being here today and thank you to Chairman Clay and Ranking Member Stivers for holding this hearing. FHA loans are essential products for Long Island families looking to purchase a new home that will help them build their own version of the American dream and most importantly help them stay on Long Island. Oftentimes these loans are made to first time home buyers, the constituency that often has the means to make the monthly mortgage payments <laughs> but also often has the most difficulty having enough capital for a large down payment. These are middle class people with good jobs and good credit scores, but maybe they aren't liquid enough to put up a large down payment in a region with some of the highest real estate values in the nation. Over the past several years, we've seen traditional lenders like banks flee the FHA market due to overzealous enforcement of the False Claims Act by the previous administration. This law was intended to prevent fraud against the U.S. government, not for immaterial mistakes like a misplaced comma on a mortgage application. I, along with my friend, Representative Gottheimer, introduced legislation last Congress to bring a fix to this frivolous liability. In May, I had a great conversation with Secretary Carson regarding this issue in this committee. Since then, HUD and DOJ have entered into an MOU on how to evaluate False Claims Act cases. Commissioner Montgomery. With HUD's recent announcement regarding entering into an MOU with DOJ on the use of the False Claims Act, do you expect to see an increase in the availability of affordable FHA loans? I would think that as more and larger traditional depositories re-enter the program, um, I would think that's good for consumers, especially those who already enjoy a relationship with that depository institution. I think some of them are concerned about the durability of our, of our MOU with justice 
and by the way, with our certifications, uh, which we uh, updated as well, meaning what happens with, with the next administration. I think with what we've done with the MOU and with our, our revised certifications, I think we're addressing that durability issue by giving the HUD voice in this process our mortgage review board, which has been around by statute for 20, 30 years or so, to help them win justice or when we believe a particular circumstance rises to the level of False Claim Act, that we make that determination together, not unilaterally, which I understand might have been happening previously. I think you're bringing some very interesting and important points up uh, to that point. Are, are there any legislative reforms needed to complement this administrative action? Again, I want to make sure I'm drawing a, a bright line that we're not going soft on people who violate our rules. It's just false claim act with its treble damages and civil money penalties drove some of the largest banks out away from our program that's been around since the Great Depression. Just in the interest of access to credits and fairness, again, not trying to take sides between depositories and independents, I just think it's better for consumers, certainly better for us to have depositories back offering our program. And to their credit, some have signaled a willingness to get back in, which others have not, which um, disappoints me. Um, but you know, we're, 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 we're not going to give up. An important part of a modern FHA is the FHA Information Technology Fund. Can you elaborate on how vital funding the FHA Information Technology Fund is? Well, this is something that we, uh, when I was commissioner last time, tried to get funding for. I know the last administration did as well, so we were very ecstatic uh, that we, we got a down payment of $20 million and hopefully we'll get the remainder. We need about $80 million uh, uh, together. We're going to completely change the way we conduct business now, which is um, hard-coded mainframes, heavy reliance on paper, move in the area of data-centric architecture, moving away from paper, fully electronic single point of entry, and uh, on par with, hopefully, with what Fannie and Freddie have done. In fact, they've been helpful, as has FHA in this effort. and. Uh, we think will rely some economies of scale, not just the ease of it and the streamline of it, being, being able to better mine the data analytics behind the numbers. So we're ecstatic to get the funding and uh, we'll remain optimistic, ultimately get everything we need. Well, you, you certainly have been advocating for FHA modernization since you were first commissioner under uh, President George W. Bush. And it's important that you're continuing that effort. Uh, I thank you, Commissioner. Both the housing market and taxpayers are in good hands with someone of your expertise and knowledge at the helm of the FHA. I yield back. Thank you, sir. OK, thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kirchhoff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, for testifying today. We know that, that HUD released the, the annual report on the financial health of the Mutual Mortgage Insurance Fund. and in the section detailing the emerging risk within the MMI fund, the, the report does note that the projected lifetime claim rates for reach, recent or, uh, originations are at their highest levels in almost 10 years, well, going back to 2009. It also, the report also highlights that this is due in part to early payment default rates increasing and that the average debt-to-income ratio increase for the sixth straight year. Uh, Commissioner, if you could, what are some of the other drivers that you think are behind the, the increase in the higher risk credit characteristics in, in recent originations? Well, you know, recall the, the, the qualified mortgage rolled through Dodd-Frank set the maximum DTI at 43% um, for reasons I'm sure we all recall. The GSEs and us were given basically what they call the patch to go above that. Um, I just want to make sure it's clear if DTI, high DTI in and of itself, is not a key predictor of how a loan's going to perform. It's to answer your question when it's been combined with other high risk characteristics, including low credit scores, um, that risk layering is what's given us some pause and what led to us to make some changes our total scorecard earlier this year, which seemed to be uh, working. We, we seem to have slowed down the, the drop 
in credit scores and uh, that's been going on for about three years. And they actually went up a point for the first time in a while. Uh, you're saying the credit scores went up for about a point? Well, they were slow declines or sort of steady state for almost three years. And the changes that we put in place appeared at least for the last two months have stopped that. And I, I, I heard what you just said about, about uh, the DTI ratios. That combined with early defaults, combined with where credit scores are now, should those three factors and others concern Congress? Well, they concerned us, which is why that we, we made those changes to the total scorecard in February uh, to, to manually refer those loans that have those risky characteristics, which essentially means that the lender now has to lift open the hood and look much deeper into the finances before they'll approve the loan. Kind of along a different line, how large of a role do cash out refinancings play in FHA's endorsement portfolio? Well, we're not anti-cash out refinance. Uh, we were just concerned that we were becoming the, the government's ATM when a lot of Fannie and Freddie borrowers who were looking to refinance moved to refinance with FHA because the terms were better. So after, again, pouring over the data for several months, we recently made the change just to, to accept the policy that the GSEs currently use, which is 80% versus the 85%. So now all three of us are aligned. <laughs> Very good. Can you uh, give your opinion about how FHA can better can strike a better balance in doing business with both depository and non-depository lenders? Well, again, I, I think getting back to the previous question and others, making sure that the durability, that there's some longevity to this process with, with the Justice Department, which again, using our existing mortgagee review board, I think provides an elegant way to provide that durability to make sure that it's there to, uh, to last. And because uh, when the new administrations come in, MOUs tend to not have love, mo much of a shelf life. But what we built into the certifications, which I don't want to get too granular here, we think helps provide a rigor, uh, a more rigorous durability to what we're trying to accomplish. Again, not to let people walk away when they run afoul of our rules, but to make sure that the penalty fits the, uh, the transgression, if you will. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate your service, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, you recognize recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I want to focus on uh, PACE loans. Uh, these are loans in every sense of the wor world uh, practically, but technically they're an increase in your property tax bill. Um, they're used uh, to help uh, finance energy efficient upgrades, often air conditioning systems. Um, as of uh, January 2017, FHA no longer insures residential mortgages that have PACE loans attached to the property uh, in a first position. And this makes sense. You're in the business of being the first mortgage and only with great creativity do we have a system where first can mean second uh, because the PACE is first and then the first is second. Uh, I've got a uh, discussion draft I'm circulating uh, to say that for a PACE loan to be adopted, uh, it needs the consent of the uh, underlying mortgage holder. That seems only fair if you bargain for a first position that you get to, to, to keep that first position. Um, uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what do you think should be done with regard to PACE loans, both to protect the mortgagor and to protect the homeowner? Well, and, and, and thanks for bringing up the, the mortgage or as well. Uh, I, there's not much I can do relative to the terms of how they're able to get the, uh, say in this case, solar equipment, if you will. Yeah, I know but, the, uh, the uh, CFPB is in the process of writing a rule, uh, but I think uh, they do an awful absolutely. lot. Absolutely. And yeah. as you're right, we, we permitted that uh, on new FHA mortgages, it's the millions of existing ones that we're concerned. And if you have some language on a, a, a bill or something, we'd be happy to, to, to look, help you in that respect. So a new FHA mortgage not only can't be issued um, or underwritten if there's already a PACE loan, but you actually have language that prevents some new PACE loan from being 
For a new FHA mortgage. That's for, that's so right. if somebody signs up for an FHA mortgage today, uh, six months from now, they cannot do a, uh, uh, a PACE uh, loan uh, without the approval of mortgage. Well, order. there's some seasoning requirement. I, I okay. can't remember exactly what it is, but Good. our concern, again, is on existing FHA loans mm -hmm. uh, that take out PACE loans that we're unaware of. And then if something happens and, you know, we find ourselves now not in a first position yeah. anymore. Now, you're, you guarantee mortgages. Uh, others in the mortgage you guarantee business stop charging a premium when you, have, uh, uh, when you hit that 78% level. That's my understanding. You still charge, even if the, the homeowner has an awful lot of equity in the house and you don't really need mortgage insurance. Uh, planning to change that? Oh, sir, I, I appreciate your question, but it, it's, I don't know of a mortgage insurance entity around that continues 100% coverage and lets you quit paying premiums, um, which would be the case if that were to happen. FHA loans are also fully assumable, uh, which is a great feature, but let's just say that it's beyond the 78% threshold. Someone could assume an FHA mortgage, get 100% coverage, yet not be paying Could you premium. develop a system to reduce the amount the homeowner has to pay when the homeowner yeah. has a whole lot of equity in the property? That, that's, that's, a, that's the right question. And so we've been looking at, as I referenced earlier, sort of premiums writ large. Uh, is there, based on however long the average FHA mortgage is, is there a way to find a little more balance? I would maintain, though, even though in the GSE space, when private mortgage insurance goes away, there is a G fee in place for the life of the loan. Yeah, I, but we're, not, we're talking about a much sure. lower rate when you have a lot more equity. I want to move on to one other. In the aftermath of a disaster, services frequently place loans in forbearance, providing time for the consumers to assess uh, uh, damages and recover. If the forbearance exceeds beyond 60 days, the loan is then reported as being in default and is recorded against the originating lender on the FHA neighborhood uh, watch uh, database, regardless of whether the home is in a disaster area. Particularly with small lenders, even a handful of mortgages can lead to a significant impact on their default rate. How can FHA ensure that lenders are not penalized for providing appropriate uh, forbearance for borrowers struggling to make payments in a disaster? Well, we've been, thank you, sir. We've been careful to strike that balance between what we believe was an industry leading loss mitigation program uh, that worked well during the, the housing crisis. Um, but translating that over into disasters, um, that is, again, something we're looking large, long and hard at, uh, especially as it relates to disasters, which is why we made a recent announcement on the standalone partial claim. Perhaps you could expand on the answer in the uh, record. Uh, thank you very much. Be happy to, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stahl, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I want to start by commending you uh, for leading FHA's uh, mutual mortgage insurance fund to its best position in recent years. Uh, FHA insurance is different from private mortgage insurance in that it remains for the life of the loan, uh, whereas private insurance falls off uh, as a borrower reaches a certain amount of equity in their home, 70, 78%. Do you agree that the ongoing nature of the risk uh, of default demands life of the loan premiums for FHA products? I, I, I believe so, and as I referenced with the previous question, if we're going to maintain 100% coverage, then we have to keep taking premiums on. And so is a reduction of life of loan coverage essentially the same as a, as a premium reduction in your eyes? Well, again, as I, if I understand your question correctly, well, the private mortgage insurance may go away at 78%, but there's a G fee included in that that uh, is less talked about. So there's still coverage, but it's something that's done through what's called a G fee with the GSEs. Thank you. So as, as I understand, the FHA is supposed to help people obtain mortgages, uh, obtain sustainable home mortgages by filling a gap uh, in the mortgage, in the market for mortgage insurance. As you know, uh, there's several private insurance uh, competing in this marketplace, which we've been discussing. How does the, can you just kind of elaborate as to how the FHA's premium pricing uh, currently compares to private mortgage insurance and how that competition is playing out in your eyes? Sure. Thank you, Congress. Well, there's, it's really almost two different types of coverage, as you referenced, when theirs falls off. Ours stays in place for the life of the loan, provided you're obviously paying the premiums. There's this partial coverage versus ours is 100%. Um, 
but I've, I've cautioned that, you know, in, to, when making sure that we're available in good times and bad, it's not our goal to supplant, you know, private capital and what private mortgage insurers are doing. Uh, I think we both perform necessary functions of the mortgage marketplace. And we just want to signal that, that we're not there to, to compete with them, if you will. But that said, we want to make sure that borrowers are ready to be borrowers who have a circumstance that fits our profile that we're there to help them. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to shift gears slightly. Uh, how do you respond to calls to cut premiums or change policies uh, in such a way that would increase the riskiness of FHA's uh, portfolio? Well, we are. And, and, and uh, do you have a specific example, or do you? Um, Broad, broadly speaking, where you well, and that's, that's part of my comment earlier. But you know, it's, we're a 1.4 trillion dollar corporation, you will, with a social mission, and requirements set forth by us from Congress. That said, we want to make sure that we can help borrowers that need the program. So this is something we look at and, and deal with every day. What is that delicate balance between risk, defined many different ways, between the right premium structure, between market dynamics, but well, there's not a lot I can do in that respect, but making sure that we're there when borrowers need us. So we're, I, I do will say this, and the technology will help us get to a much better place in terms of looking at data more robustly and faster than we're able to do today. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here today, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Gooden, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield my time to Mr. Stivers of Ohio. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, Commissioner, again, uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I don't think you've got a lot of questions about housing finance reform proposals, have you? Did I miss a few questions? You got a, maybe there was one, but I, there hadn't been a ton. I, I wanted to just tell you I was pleased that uh, HUD had some housing finance reform proposals that you issued earlier this year. Uh, they focused their attention on how FHA would continue its mission, uh, although a reform mission. Um, it did talk about FHA continuing to effectively serve creditworthy first-time low-income home buyers. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So one of the recommendations listed in the report included restructuring FHA as an autonomous government corporation within HUD. Would you be able to expand on talking about how this restructuring would allow FHA to better either address personnel, technology, or contracting issues, which would allow you to, to continue that mission? So well, th well, thank you very much for, for the question. Just to be clear, we would FHA would still be part of HUD and would still report to the HUD secretary. Right, but it would be a, would have a little more autonomy. <laughs> well, we'd be a wholly owned corporation, similar yeah. to what Jenny May is. We think the ability to have more. Um, Tell us what that would let you do. Help us help everybody understand the benefits of that. Yeah, I think have a little more um, uh, flexibility in terms of procurement and hiring. Uh, you know, we're the largest mortgage insurance entity ever, and. Uh, you know, we are looking at critical pay, the ability to pay some of our staff more as well. Um, so beyond procurement personnel, we just think having a little more flexibility would, would, would be very helpful. One area that also be very helpful is to make sure we don't find ourselves in a predicament that we have today in terms of our technology. Uh, obviously, the receipts would still be, you know, controlled by this body, um, but helping ensure that we have some consistent level of funding for our systems would would go a long way to help and ensure we don't have a similar problem we're encountering today that we're, of course, desperately trying to fix. I think that's, uh, thank you for that. I think that uh, would be a helpful way to give you a little more authority and autonomy to right. do some things, including keeping your technology modern, which um, we've already talked about, the, the $20 million down payment on a $100 million problem. And uh, so I, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to expand on that a little bit. So, uh, Commissioner, I don't know if you've had a chance to review Maxine Waters' principles for housing finance reform. Have you seen them? I've seen parts of them. and So I'll lay a few of them out just so we're all on the same sheet. Uh, one of her principles is maintaining the 30-year uh, fixed income mortgage, I'm sorry, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage option. Is that something you support as a principle? Maintaining the 30-year fixed rate mortgage in the TBA market, yes, absolutely. Great. Uh, a second one is ensuring there's private capital in place to protect taxpayers. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes. 
Another one is uh, providing stability and liquidity so that we can withstand a future financial crisis. Do you think that's a good idea? That's something we work on every day. Great. And uh, another one is maintaining access for all qualified borrowers so that they can achieve home ownership, the dream of home ownership. Is that something that you agree with? Absolutely. We, we, we want to make sure that borrowers are ready for home ownership and get the type of mortgage that is appropriate for their circumstance. So, so I ask you those questions because I ask uh, Mr. Calabria and Chairman Mnuchin and your and Secretary, sorry, Secretary Mnuchin and Secretary Carson, they all also agreed with those principles. The point of bringing this up is that even though we have not made any progress on housing finance reform since the financial crisis, uh, which was now 11 years ago, there is a lot we all agree on. Chairwoman Waters, you, I, the three principles I spoke about, all agree on those principles. I think it's time to roll up our sleeves and pursue bipartisan housing finance reform, and I would like to work with you on that. That's the third thing I brought up today I want to work with you on, so I, I hope we can work together on that. Is that something you'd be willing to work with us on? Absolutely, and I've, I've never admitted this publicly, but I'll say it today, that's one of the reasons why I came back. Great. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for everything you've already done. I'm very much looking forward to work with you uh, on many things, including uh, trying to do some real housing finance reform. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman from Ohio. I look forward to working with you and the administrator on how we get to a place where this country, where people can share uh, in the American dream in home ownership. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. I thank the chairman, thank the ranking member for allowing an interloper on the subcommittee's business today. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, thank you for coming back to FHA. Thank you, Dr. Carson, for doing a terrific job representing the taxpayers at, at HUD. There's been a lot of talk today about the uh, MMFI fund and its, its health uh, being well in excess of of 2%, uh, now over 4%, so congratulations on that. Philosophically, I hope you'll let that capital continue to grow. I remember vividly in the early 2000s in the Bush administration when the FDIC began to rebate uh, and no longer take deposit insurance premiums, saying that Congress had already capped it, and we know how that ended. And we were all asked to pay three years of deposit insurance premiums in 2008 in one quarter because of that imprudent decision alleging the statute only required blank. So I, I like seeing a bigger number. I wanted to start out by asking you, how do you stress test uh, that, uh, that uh, capital adequacy number? Sure, well we have a, a, a contractor, an actuarial contractor, actually uh, two of them. Uh, then we have an independent actuarialist that looks at their work as well. Uh, we also have a risk team that works with them and we put them through any number of uh, stress tests. And that, that includes uh, falling housing prices or no appreciation Absolutely. of housing. Absolutely, looking at extreme economic situations. And that includes uh, a, net, a discount rate on the net present value of counting future cash flows, which normal people don't do in, in capital, but you do. And that, that, that can work both ways. As we yeah, know. of course it does, yeah. So, yes, sir, we, we put it through dozens of different stress tests. Good. And those are all available in our uh, annual, right. the annual report. Yeah, I look forward to studying them in more detail. I just was uh, interested in, and is that done annually by the contractor? It is, and what we... Is it ongoing, almost quarterly? It is, it is ongoing, yeah. as we know the economy changes. Right. Um, and we're, 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 we always try to stay ahead of that. And there's Good. a lot of data out there that helps us as well. A lot of conversation today about uh, non-bank originators now, uh, shockingly, according to Chairman Lukemeyer, up in the uh, uh, over 80% of your originations now, and you, you talked a lot about false claims today and explained that in detail. I'm interested in a different point of view about it, which is the quality of the underwriting between a depository that uh, initiates an FHA loan versus a non-depository. Is there a big difference in the underwriting there? Well, I would speak for our criteria, obviously. I understand. Uh, our stays the same. Um, I, I don't want to speak for depositors or, or non-depositors, and I think they strive to follow our guidelines and stay within the bounds mm -hmm. that, that we uh, require. And um, When you look at your underwriting, which you've got up on the board there in, in front of you, it's been talked about today, but you've seen 
as you've said, uh, increase in a reduction in credit scores. And let's go to the next one. Um, increase in debt to income ratios pretty substantially. And I, I wondered, you referenced it a few minutes ago that uh, FHA had looked at uh, residual income tests like the VA has. Is that something you're actively considering? Well, it is something we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, I think it's been very helpful for the Veterans Administration, especially the fact that it varies based on region of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is something that we are looking at. Again, I just want to stress DTI by itself. It's when, you know, it's, it's not the true indicator, but when coupled with other factors. Yeah, I just, when you see them all going up, it, it caused me some concern. I was glad to see your capital where it was. And I know you've taken changes only recently in, in FY19, so I understand that. But when I saw all the major indicators of underwriting deteriorating, it certainly got my attention. But I feel like you've covered that today pretty well. Yes, sir. And we've, we've, we had a fantastic risk team. We now have brought a, a retiree over from one of the GSEs who was the chief risk officer there. Thanks. Let me shift one final, one final point. Um, and that's um, the issue of distressed asset stabilization program. Selling assets boosts the deposit, the uh, uh, MMFI, doesn't it? Well, it, if the, well, it depends on where they're 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 sold in the, in the process. Um, as you know, we're but if you've we're, if you've taken a property back and you're selling it, is a net contribution? Yes. Yeah. If it goes to REO, right? Uh, note sales. Yes, but note sales are a little different than REO sales. But you wouldn't As want a, anything to encumber your ability from distressed sales to build capital, would you? Well, I, I think one thing the previous administration did and that we've continued to do is, is to find other, all, uh, other alternatives to, to REO mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the, the carrying costs of those are borne by us. The, uh, the time that they'll sit there um, is also borne by us. We have contractors we have to pay, certainly. So the ability to use claims without conveyance of title and note sales. Yeah. Uh, has I'll been be interested. Helpful. I'll follow up with you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence on the time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank our witness uh, for his testimony today. Uh, and, and we appreciate you sharing uh, with this committee. Uh, your thoughts on the future of where we go with the housing policy of this nation. Uh, and, and before I close out, and let me, let me finish some housekeeping first. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for their response. I ask our witness to please respond as promptly as you are able. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And now I will take a point of personal privilege to um, reckon to, to say congratulations uh, to Mr. Gooden of Texas or to you and your wife on the addition um, of a new family member, your daughter. Uh, so congrats to you. I yield Thank you, to Mr. Jill. Chairman. I appreciate it very much and look forward to bringing her here someday soon to meet you all. Very good. What's her name? Mila Michelle Gooden. Very good. Born last congrats week. Congrats again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Mr.